right, we're gonna go ahead and get started here in just a moment. Um, for those of us who are uh, joining us for the first time, welcome to Youthathon, uh, where we will be for the next 24 hours hearing from uh, passionate and brilliant environmentalists, researchers, scientists uh, from all over the world. Um, during our last session, we just heard from Paul Rose, and uh, Paul was uh, telling us about how uh, careers in environmentalism are at least as diverse as uh, the oceans in our environment themselves. So for those of us young people who are uh, right at the beginning of our careers and, and looking to figure out how we can um, uh, stay engaged with the efforts to protect our planet and the people that inhabit it, there's so many different kinds of opportunities. You do not have to spend 15 years getting a PhD in school though, some people might want to do that. Um, so for our next session, and I'm really, really excited about this, uh, we have Lognajita Mukapadie and Akila Bandalora, both of whom are going to be uh, talking to us about poetry and the environment um, and really encouraging us to think maybe a little bit differently about things. So I'm gonna pass it on to both of them to introduce themselves now. Um, and for those of you watching, you might want to get a pen and pencil, uh, pencil and paper for this session. So uh, Lagunjita, uh, Akila, uh, passing it on to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, so I'm gonna start it off with intros. So my name is Akila Banlora and I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. I just graduated high school and I'm headed to college in the fall. Um, so first and foremost, I identify as a poet, which hasn't really been correlating um, with me writing a lot of poetry recently, but I like to think that being a poet extends to how you live life. And so for me, this means always reflecting and teaching and learning from others' stories. And so there are a lot of people in my life that I consider poets, regardless of whether they actually write poetry or not. So for example, like, in one of my high school like biology classes, someone asked a really insightful question. I was like, wow, poet. You know, it's just like how you think and reflect. And I think that poetry has a really unique role in the environmental justice movement specifically, but in all movements um, as it's a vehicle for people to tell their stories and um, for them also to consider others. And these stories are inseparable from the future we are trying to reimagine and reinvent and which which in my opinion is what makes poetry so powerful um, and kind of like less philosophically speaking i really like octopuses and i'm interning this summer with from the Bowsey, and i'm also a youth leadership council member with earth echo and i encourage you to check out from the bow seat session which is later today um, and i wanted to pass the buck off to lagna jita and have her introduce herself super excited for this hey guys I'm Lagardina, and I'm also a poet, um, but I recently, can you guys see me? Is everything okay? All right, cool. Yeah. Um, I recently graduated from college, um, and I majored in English and art history, and I've been on tour for my book and poetry album, um, but the day I left, for the tour um, was the first COVID case in America. Um, obviously, I didn't know it at the time, and so we've we've been having like kind of a rough time on the road. But um, going off of what Akila said, I think what it has taught me is that poetry like can be accessible in ways that um, are not traditionally seen uh as accessible like it's not just dead white guys um we were having a conversation on the phone the other day um talking about if people could read modern poetry um they would really understand um what was going on in the world obviously at the time but just really understanding how words are literally the primary form of communication that we have here and um i think the, the, the limited structure of poetry is just a structure and that and that's that's all it is um just like an academic article is just a structure 
and so I think you know I've met a lot of great scientists who are great poets and and vice versa and um, I'm excited to you know kind of get the session started um, I'm also cooking during this session so I'm making um, a classic Bengali dish um, called Jingyu Machi Malaikari and so it's like it's like happening right now. I'm um, just gonna add the shrimp in, but yeah, I'm really excited. So um, we wanted to start this session off with a poem by Angela Jackson, um, which is called "Woman Watches and." woman watches ocean on a reef through a glass bottomed boat um and i'm gonna paste the poem into the chat really quickly um one second and um with Manjita, did you want to perform it or say it or do you want me to you got it okay cool let me Pull it up on my actually here it's on my phone. Um, one second, guys. Okay, I got it. So the title is "Woman Watches Ocean on a Reef Through a Glass Bottom Boat," and it's by Angela Jackson. In the ocean, one fish swallows the other, a geometric progression of loss. You are bigger than I. The calamity of love swelling out larger than us. And what destiny partakes of our dilemma, swallows the cause and effect, eyes and kissing mouths and enlarged parts wanting to breathe and wanting. There is no gentle sense to this, is there? Only a kind of terror at the chain of events, the scale of loss, the ordered destruction one against the other, all that something larger awaits this moment. So. Thank you. Okay, so um, I wanted to clarify something really quickly, but when you see both of us snapping, it's basically like poetry's version of popping. So um, yeah, <laughs> um, I was actually thinking about this poem a lot, but I wanted to pass it off to you because I just like spoke. Um, if you had any thoughts um, about this poem, because you're the one who sent it and found it, which I'm really grateful for. No, I think when I first read the poem um it obviously clicked with me as a woman but um it also clicked with me in terms of uh, the whiteness of environmental spaces um is kind of something that's obviously not only limiting um for the cause but like quite detrimental um especially as it regards, you know, the, the actual people on the ground that are getting affected, um, you know, currently. And so I think when I first read the poem, I felt that deep sadness um, within, you know, the, the loss that she talks about, the terror, you know, um, within just kind of understanding that we're gonna be the ones affected first. <laughs> Um, everybody else is going to, you know, run inside the continent, whatever, whatever there's land and, um, you know, kind of operate from a place of privilege. Um, and I think the poem perfectly encapsulates that sense of one, just otherness in the movement, but just otherness when it comes to both climate struggles as a whole, but also just world life struggles. For sure. Um, and kind of just to echo your thoughts, I was really, like I mentioned before, really glad you sent this poem. And I've actually been thinking about it a lot. I journaled with it. And one of the things I kept coming back to is like when I thought, and still when I think about what like a stereotypical nature poem is, I drift towards like Whitman or Thoreau. Yeah, Thoreau. Um, so like this idea of like images of like leaves rustling in the winds and like the subject of that poem being in like this position of power, like exhibiting this gaze on nature in this really like exploitative way, if that makes any sense. And then in comparison with like Jackson's poem, there's like these under like undercurrents of like community source power, like woven throughout it. Like this idea of 
learning revolution from the ocean is something that I really resonated with. And um, that's like how I was taught to like view nature in this like kind of very like cooperative way. And I think that's how a lot of people have grown up with nature. And I think that's a like narrative that's really excluded from the movement, um, especially with like indigenous communities, like the way we've been excluded from the movement. And it's definitely getting better now, but there's still so much work that's left to be done. And I think, like, to go off of that, like, Thoreau's mom packed him lunch, you know? Yeah, like, literally. Like, <laughs> I think that's a good, <laughs> that's a good example of, like, um, you know, the, the very important climate work that's been done literally from the beginning of time, you know, has yeah. never been Western, you know, ideas or Western ideals. Um, in fact, the Western world flipped all those on you know, it's head and called it uncivilized. So I think yeah, literally. And I also in a Oh sorry, sorry, I cut you off. <laughs> no, no, go yeah. ahead. Oh my gosh, okay, I'll go because this is awkward. But, um just to go back to Thoreau, this idea of like escapism into nature, like only using nature when it's to your benefit is so wrong. Like I I I think that like unlearning that and the fact that like Thoreau is a necessary text in school or like that's what I was taught in like AP Lang. Like the fact that our education system just like ingrains that in us from day one when when a lot of us have been taught something completely different at home, like is is just so damaging. Um, um but yeah. Exactly. And the and to the whole idea of trying to, you know, like go into nature as a separate entity, as as a human who's interfering with the environment versus, you know, us being a part of nature and coexisting with the environment, um, I think is a very Western concept. And I think, honestly, some of the greatest environmental leaders that I look up to now are trying so hard to push back against that and, you know, return, return to the, to the roots of the earth. Um, and I think, it's it's more than just like like a trend you know and i think we talked about you know, like the straws or the turtles or the polar bears you know mm -hmm. like and i think that is just barely scratching the surface of this type of work and i think poetry like this specifically um allows for the, the resurgence and the kind of you know platform that the real movement deserves Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I think just like going back to the point I made earlier about like how this poem emphasizes learning from the ocean as like this power of like revolution, I think is so important right now that we like drift back towards this work, um, especially with all the different crises like being exposed right now, police brutality, systemic racism, healthcare, like, like disparities. Like I think that this idea of using nature not as like not as something to be gained or like any of that but just something to be learned from is really important and something I've been thinking a lot about um but yeah I could talk about this poem for so long I feel like every line is just something so like profound um but uh I know you had a poem you wanted to share so I'm gonna <laughs> yeah um so this poem I wrote when I was like pretty young so like no disclaimer. Um, <laughs> it is it is great. a spoken word poem, which I think it's important. I'm not a spoken word poet. I'm a performance poet, but I think spoken word is a very important um, platform in that the poets I see now speaking out about these issues are spoken word poems because it ties or spoken word poets because it ties so well into activism, and mm -hmm. so. Uh, I kind of felt that that's probably like a better route to go down in terms of poetry. Um, and I also want to, before I read, kind of allude to, you know, this kind of current um, stance towards environmentalism as this term called dominator ecology. Um, if you want to look that up, please go look that up. But I think it's, it's a very uh, broad way of describing kind of how environmental movements and the ins 
perception of them, like the fact that it's a movement in general, um, instead of just a way of life, um, has become this kind of dominator, like colonial um, stance. And I really, really want to push mm. against that, um, especially in this panel, as it links to poetry and change and social revolution, I want to kind of bring us towards a more anarchist uh, ecology. Um, but this is called Tsunami. I too, the ocean, have no country. The lines on maps cannot show me my home, my ecosystem. It is slowly being taken from me. One coral reef to the next, one ocean breeze to another, seaweeded out. The light does not touch me often. Underwater is already the darkest place on earth. My skin, like yours, I fight. Your fight, no one can see. I'm invisible, save for the boats that float over my being, only to forget me when they're gone. I am like you, island people. I taste of salt like your tears. I fight to survive like you for your children. I give you fish so that you need me as much as I need you. We are all refugees. Flooded with displacement and disappointment. We speak the same tidal language. We want the same things. To meet at equilibrium, to live in the midst of life to question if this is a green problem or a brown one. I, to the ocean, belong to no one. My people are the same as yours. My mother is the sphere we share. My birth certificate has no defining name. Who are we to call our own bodies ours alone? I, to the ocean, have been here all along, like natives who put a god into every grain of dirt, every mountain, every tree and sea, and prayed to it to think that I once had a religion, a mantra surging through my crevices, a ritual resting in my caves, a speck sleeping under my shell. Well, where is the spirit, the faith, this understanding that we do not own this land. How can we fight each other for what was not ours to begin with? We are killing it. They are killing us. We are an orchestra of waves with a dead conductor. Our voices silenced or unheard. Our songs a fruitless cry into the sunset. We cannot control this orb of light. So white, hot. It's rising and falling is natural, or drowning is not. They still do not kill us. I, too, the ocean, am tired of waiting. But when the ships sink 10,000 fathoms under the bottom, and you will be smothered first, and I will accept you. They will be on lifeboats called money, and you will swim amongst the rest of the weekend, their privilege and eclipse. While we cease to be, there is only enough air at the top and not enough for me. I quake when I cannot breathe. You and they must change because I too, the ocean, do not want to become a tsunami. Huge snaps. That was great. Um, yeah, wow. Um, I just wanted to plug really quickly that you should all follow Lagna Jita on Instagram and support her if you can. Um, incredible work, like literally. Um, and also, I wanted to <clears throat> throw out there that if you have any questions, please um, put them in the chat in the Q&A box. We will get to them at the end or sometime in the rest of the session. But um, I just wanted to say that like 
the like when I was thinking about this poem and also Angela Jackson's I found so many similarities and I think that's something I see a lot of especially with like women of color writing poetry there's this like very strong like community source power within all of that and I think that that power is what we need to lead the environmental movement going forward um, this idea of like corporations or even like big companies or organizations saving us is so like mis misleading. I think that both of these poems just speak to what it means to have power as a community and I really appreciate that. Um, and I know during our phone call a few days ago, um, we were talking about the huge cyclone that just like wrecks Bengal. So I'm gonna throw it back to you because I think that's really important to share. Yeah, I think when we, when we think of this kind of work, um, there is that, you know, sense of, of whiteness um, that, is, you know, wouldn't be like damaging if, you know, everyone had kind of an equal platform. Um, but there is, you know, huge cyclone, um, the biggest cyclone uh, of all time, actually, um, that ravaged India very recently um, and it affected my home city. Um, my whole family is there, you know, my grandparents got flooded. A lot of people didn't have power. A lot of their homes are damaged because obviously the structures there are not, you know, as strong. Um, and another big thing is that um, they kind of, the cyclone itself was kind of like a barrier, uh, like there was a barrier to the cyclone um, in the form of the Shundorbon, which is a huge teeming uh, jungle ecosystem in Bengal um, that, you know, is home to some of the greatest biodiversity um, on this earth. Um, it's also home to many, you know, uh, villagers and farmers and people of color um, and it's their livelihood. Um, it's also home to, you know, just in terms of, you know, the, the Bengal tiger. Everybody knows that, you know, I think that's like a good kind of connect, connecting point for the Western world. But um, this just happened, right? And I maybe saw, you know, one or two articles on BBC, you know, which is a British, you know, the British world is much more connected to India, obviously. Um, but that's kind of really all I saw about it in the Western media um, and in the Western world. And I just couldn't help thinking about the comparison between the bushfires in Australia, which, you know, like huge, I'm not trying to minimize any other <laughs> disaster, but I think the, the appropriate amount of effort and time was given to that natural disaster. And I think because of that, it was, you know, dealt with in a sense, um, you know, the best they could do. But I don't think that was applied to the cyclone, um, especially since they had another one after. Um, and I think in these types of, you know, places that are already economically, you know, at a disadvantage because of colonialism, um, these kind of issues are even more devastating to not only, you know, the environment that is there, but just like the lives that are there, um, that are trying to, you know, coexist with the environment. And I think thinking about that and seeing that, like, made me question kind of, you know, what it is that we're doing with mm -hmm. this work. And I think, in contrast, when I listen to, you know, the poems of, you know, people from indigenous nations and um, island nations, like, I sense, I feel that, you know, and I think that's the power of poetry in, in that um, it's not kind of that, that old white ideal anymore, or it shouldn't be. Um, oh, yeah. read you really quick, but like, my dad commented on my Facebook 
post. Um, he said, nature is no longer the rustic retreat of the Wordsworthian poet. It is now a political, a political question, a question of survival. Um, and I need to ask him uh, who's actually said that, but I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's like the, the beauty of, you know, creative writing in general, but poetry at this moment in time, because if you really look at um, the, the, the people that are like making waves that are like killing it right now, they are, you know, people of color and like, I really like that. Seeing that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, I think we talked about, well, I think I brought this up on our phone call, but um, talk, I was thinking about sustainability and specifically like when in regards to like culture and language and the fact that these huge natural disasters are wiping out communities and we never even talk about it and all that language is being lost and um, this and this idea of language is how people tell their stories, how people share their story. And poetry is like, frankly, like the oldest way of doing that. Like I was, I've been like um, uh, trying to reconnect, well not reconnect, but like learn more about my mother tongue. And the fact that like Canada, which is like a language of Southern India has had like such a deep and long history of poetry. And like, that's something I never learned about. I just was like taught Greek and Latin poets were like the epitome of what poetry was and the fact that like we don't have access to these narratives and that they're being washed away because of gentrification like new colonialism etc cetera, etc cetera, is really devastating especially for especially indigenous communities um and i think that we need to rethink sustainability in terms of people and culture and not like straws and whatever else like that's important but people are infinitely more important you know um so yeah, yeah. I definitely. Kind of going off of that, um based off of our, our conversation it's like really like fascinating like you said the connection between language and environment um and just language and colonialism in general um and you know it, it kind of presents itself in all like forms of culture which i think is a very interesting thing to examine. Um, I was telling Akila about how, like, um, there there was an interview done with a member of a indigenous nation, and you know, he was talking about his you know foods that they have at like festivals and you know cultural events, and it's like he was talking about cakes and shortbread and things like that, and like it's so important to like remember that that wasn't you know, their, their traditional food, um, African nations, like, black, what it is to be black in America was forced upon, you know, both culture, they had to speak English, you know, their names were stolen from them. And they had to cook, you know, the, the leftovers that the slave owners would like, you know, pretty much throw in their direction. And I think, a huge part of that can be reclaimed, obviously with like cooking, like I'm kind of doing right now, but just with language. And there's a lot of nations that there's like one person left who speaks the language. And I think it's beautiful when they, um, there's a resurgence of effort to try to pass the language on because when you lose language, you are losing your connection to the viewer. You're losing your roots and, um, yeah, I think like sustainability in that regard, like, is that not a form of sustainability that we should? It, I think it's on? the most important, like, um, sustaining, like, yeah, like, sustaining the, the land, like, for sure. Yeah, um, I remember um, we also talked about. Um, I think you recommended a podcast, and I haven't listened to it yet, but I looked it up on Spotify. And it was super interesting so i'm just gonna i'm gonna let you plug that because i think more people need to listen to it um are you talking about the the food one yeah the food one yeah so i'm like kind of obsessed with like food science and kind of like how you know just like just like poetry is a kind of a megaphone into culture um so it's food 
Um, and there's this podcast called The Doctor's Pharmacy by Dr. Mark Hyman. Um, if anybody has any like more, you know, um, non-traditional voices of podcasts talking about this, please let me know. But this is a white dude, full disclosure. Um, but I think when white people use their power to kind of like amplify you know the other voices i think it is becomes a very strong and powerful like message towards the rest of the world and i think he has a lot of um his his approach is um non-traditional medicine um and functional medicine and how just all of the the parts of your mind and, and body are connected to food um mm-hmm. and even your mental health is connected to what you eat. Um, and I think speaking about what we eat and how we source what we eat, you know, it all is like this, you know, it's intersectional, obviously, but it's all tied together in this, in this remarkable way of like, okay, like the shrimp that I'm cooking right now is from Argentina, which is in the Southern Hemisphere. And I learned today that the Southern Hemisphere is cleaner than the northern hemisphere which like kind of blew my mind because you know we're always taught that like you know other civilizations are backwards and and dirty and like i think everyone you know anyone who's indian can attest to the fact that like if somebody if we tell them we're from india like they're like oh it's like dirty and loud and you know um but i think that's it's a great podcast to listen to, to if you're kind of wanting to one, think about how, you know, your body is connected to the earth, um, but also to think about how we can take back the earth and take back our body and, um, you know, say, you know, we're not going to feel big food anymore. We're not going to, you know, let our corporations place one grocery store in, in a black neighborhood that's just actually a corner store um we're not gonna have coke fund you know all of the centers of positive and progressive growth anymore things like that i think will you know not only just impact civilization and like um just people's health but you know that has a direct correlation with the earth's like Mm -hmm. for sure okay so there's two questions in the chat but really quickly before that i wanted to touch on something you said about privilege um so i think that this is something that is being like talked about a lot more right now on social media but this idea of privilege in this movement and this idea of like acknowledging privilege not as something to become defensive about but as something to like use very um like generously if that makes sense not even generously like you need to use your privilege like it's you should use it um but i think when we're talking about privilege that it's easy to become defensive and to unlearn. And I think poetry is a really good tool for reflection on what kind of privilege you have. And not, and poetry can take so many forms. I feel like poetry, poetry is really taught, like I said before, Greek, Latin, line breaks, which is not what poetry is. It's really just like journaling and then like, like you create whatever you want, like whatever structure you want from that. So um, yeah, I think journaling, at least for me, has been a really good way to reflect on um, like the privilege that I have um, just existing. So I think that um, I just wanted to throw that out there um, because you touched on it. And the two questions in the chat. So first one is from Bailey. Um, So she asked, who are some of your favorite contemporary poets? God, that's a hard one. Um, I think me and Akila both had a conversation about um, Hanif (laughs) Oh. <laughs> I love Hanif. Hanif Abdurraqib. I'm gonna type the name in the chat later, but um, I was supposed to see them on March 24th before like COVID, everything COVID happened. But um, like Najita got to I see them. So. <laughs> um, in a tiny room, and it was like shaking like the whole time. Um, I think he or they um. Does a, they do a lot of work in um, connecting music to writing, which is like a whole nother can of worms, but um, music journalism is very important to kind of once again dissecting a culture and, and 
tapestry of a place. Um, and as we know, so much of American music is really black music. Um, and I think they do a really good job kind of um, incorporating their othered experience in music communities that is really, you know, rooted from their tradition and not the white people. Like, and I think like, it's very powerful. It, it's very powerful work. Um, and Ocean Vuong. Oh. Ocean <laughs> yeah. Like Ocean Poetry, it's like Ocean Vuong. Um, it's not Ocean Poetry, but it's good poetry. I really recommend. Um, Have you read their book? Yes. I need to reread it. Um, but yeah, two great poets. Um, I'm going to add on Lucille Clifton. I adore Lucille. Like, I, that was my senior quote. Um, like, one of her poems, it's called, wait, I'm literally blanking on the name, but um, what did I see to be except myself is the quote I use. And I think that Lucille's poetry just like encapsulates that. I highly recommend, especially for like poetry, people who are like interested in poetry, but are like struggling to read like really long form poetry. Poems are super short, very concise and very meaningful. I love her poetry. Um, and then who else? Yeah, Hanif, Ocean, um, absolutely. And also if you're looking for more like teen poets, I would highly recommend Kinsale Houston. She's doing incredible work right now, raising funds for the Navajo Nation and White, White Mountain Apache who have like the highest COVID rates right now. Um, one of them is based in Arizona. Um, but yeah, highly recommend following her. Um, and I'll put that in the action doc um, later. But yeah, and then the second question was, um, uh, can you tell us more about the meal you're cooking? Uh, okay. Um. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a, a very, very um, near and dear meal to my heart. Um, my parents always joke about how, like, when my mom makes this meal, like, they don't have to wash the dishes because um, it's clean. Um, but this is pretty much a, like, a take on a coconut shrimp, um, but in the Indian tradition. Um, it's not a curry because curry is not a thing. I'm just going to say this right now, uh, curry is a colonial uh, device used to, you know, lump everything together that we don't even have the word curry in our language, so. Curry and I feel like people are, like, really shocked when I tell them this, like, they really feel, like, attacked. Yeah, um, I think I have to use the word curry to, like, try and explain what I'm doing, because it, 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 like, the non-Western, like, the real word for it is, like, something they haven't heard. Um, that's a whole other conversation, but yes, continue. <laughs> yeah, so, um, basically, I'll just give a real quick rundown of what I've done so far. I have the shrimp I told you I sourced, that's from, uh, Argentina, which is better, and other than the whole carbon footprint thing, we won't go into that. And then, um, I'm cooking tomatoes and onions. And you put that down a little bit, and then you add your coconut milk that's mixed with turmeric. And you cook that down a little bit. And I don't have measurements for this, because, like, Mothers don't have measurements, so, like, <laughs> you know, learn them. I'm just like, is this the right color? Um, and then you cook kind of that down, um, and then you'll add your salt, maybe a little bit of sugar, uh, chili powder, um, and garam masala if you want to be fancy, and I mean, garam masala is another, you know. That's yeah, I, yeah, again, a whole separate conversation. Whole separate um, conversation. The way we've um, adapted, like, food to the Western gaze is, like, exactly that, that is, like, yeah, it's, another it's, conversation. Um, so, yeah, so then you add all of that, and then you re-add your shrimp, and you, you cook it together, and obviously you eat it with rice. Okay, cool. And then the last question we have in the chat is, how do you boost creativity if you aren't a naturally creative person? Oh, Lord. I think naturally creative people, whatever that means, like, also have to boost creativity. <laughs> um, I think, for me at least, it's more of just, I'm more of a person who just observes a lot. Um, and 
does it right most of the time. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my creativity is like I'm not writing. Um, I'm just kind of observing what's going on, and then maybe just like jotting down like something funny in my notes or something I saw, or, like maybe like a line or two. Um, and then kind of I am revisiting because I can never write about anything like once it's just happened um I, I always like need some time to process what has happened before I go back to it um which I think gives a good like neutral perspective on something which I think is the antithesis of journaling I think it's important to journal as well like immediately um but I also think like for me what's helped me process emotion instead of being stuck in something um and, and kind of inspire creativity is just coming back to something that has already mm -hmm. happened um and so when i do that i feel as though um like the creativity just kind of naturally flows in a sense because you just as an inherent human are creative i really believe this like like anything you, like imagination is is kind of almost inherent like if you look at kids almost inherent um, in people's lives, and I don't think, like, it needs to be forced. I just think, you know, a lot of practice has to be done. Um, practice reading, practice writing. Um, you know, my dad always says to be a, a second-rate poet, you have to be a, or second-rate writer, you have to be a first-class reader. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is, in a sense, of, like, how more so I, I kind of boost my own creativity of like just a lot of not writing and not being traditionally creative in the sense that people think, um, but just going with the flow. I, yeah, I just wanted to like echo that, like um, this idea of creativity, I feel like has been so warped by STEM and like this like forced separation between the two when you really, when you can be creative as like, a scientist I feel like you have to be creative as a scientist to imagine a world where like your solution or whatever exists um so like you said journaling imagining that's all creative I don't think there is such a thing as a naturally creative person I feel like everyone is creative in their own right whatever that manifests um for you um but yeah points were made um and okay so I just looked at the time <laughs> and we and we wanted to launch into this kind of reflection space, um, just um, letting people kind of journal about what they've heard and what they've seen in the world for the past, like forever, I guess, and just don't stop writing. So basically kind of like a free write. I don't know if I explained that correctly. So I'm gonna, if you have anything just, to add, just please don't, do. Don't take the pen off the page pretty much is what we're taught. Like just keep, if you're typing just keep even if it's gibberish whatever like just keep writing um and kind of in a sense i know it's difficult to like reflect and write like constantly at the same time but I, that's like the point um and i think thinking about you know these things like you'll probably be surprised how much you might come out mm -hmm. for sure and like i've done this exercise quite a few times and for a large chunk of the time, sometimes I was just writing the same word again and again and again until I thought of a new word. So um, just this idea of kind of like generating thoughts is, it's hard, but like very necessary. Um, and yeah, so while people get to do that, I wanted to bring up something that we talked about a lot, but I don't think we touched on in this is just like um, the whiteness that we see in like, environmental spaces like coming into creative spaces and just like recognizing that it's everywhere like when I when we're talking about whiteness it's not in a silo in the space it's like it's everywhere and like it's been so pronounced at least for me like when I've started to go to conferences um this year and being like the only young person the only young person of color the young, only young woman of color, it's just like um and then just feeling tokenized and I think that um, when conferences and when I've watched like some of these conferences and like organizations put out um, diversity statements in lieu of everything that's happened, it feels very forced and, um, you know, um, not indicative of how they've been treating 
um, all these participants in the past. And um, I just think that dedicating yourself to anti-racist work is a process and it should be a continued process of education. And I was wondering, first of all, thoughts and also like resources of anything you've read that you found like particularly helpful. Um, and yeah. I think there's, you know, speaking of like, you know, anti-racism and creative spaces, like obviously we had a lengthy conversation about how um, no matter what kind of environment it is, no matter what, you know, the session is, whatever, like there's always a sense of like tokenization versus like kind of like um, Kimberly Crenshaw said this well, but like we need to abolish like uh, using Kimberly Rosary, sorry, uh, using like free labor as kind of a, a tool for a platform or, you know, an opportunity, because I think for my whole life, I've um, accepted, um, you know, opportunities and talks and spaces and like, you know, given people so much advice and, you know, done free consulting and like all this stuff, um, thinking that, hey, this might give me you know, a platform finally, like, it's fine, I don't get paid, like, at least I get a space, and I think, like, looking back in retrospect, it's such a, like, toxic environment to think that, like, someone uh, that doesn't look like me, you know, just inherently gets that space, and probably gets paid, um, but, you know, I am kind of just forced to, to appreciate, you know, anything that is like remarkable being thrown at me. Like when I think of, you know, what all these brands are doing with their, like, we support black lives. It's like, you know, like, should, should we give you a cookie? Like, I I don't, you know, it's like, we need to uproot the whole creative system as a whole. And, you know, like, you know, it reminds me of authors so white and everything, like every movement, every powerful movement, every, you know, uh, radicalization of experience has been done by women of color and so I think we, we give a lot of things out for free and I think um, thinking about representation is like very shallow in a sense of like it, it's more than just representation it's like it's it's a huge structural you know thing from the root and kind of tying that creative space to the environmental space it's the same thing. It's like if you don't give the people that are most connected to the earth, like the mm -hmm. space, and time, and honestly, the money. Because money, like, money, pay people. <laughs> you literally like, pay people. You know. But yeah, I think I, I also have like a really small quote um, from Mel Basil. He's like an amazing um, indigenous anarchist. Um, but he said, "It might feel out of place." free to ask permission to exist somewhere, but what you're saying is, can I bring my knowledge with yours together to share in the responsibilities in your lands? Because the people here have thousands and thousands of years of observation of how to exist with the lands and with the biodiversity and how to have a relationship with the water. We don't own the water. We can't put our name on it. We don't own the land. We own our responsibilities to the land and to the water. That's how I relate anarchy and indigenous society. We transcend rights, each of us. I think that was a, oh, a wonderful way to end this. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm gonna check if we have any other questions. We have a lot of snaps. <laughs> like, so just, I think yeah. that's a great way to end this. And um, how is the food coming along? Just quickly before we end really really good timing because i don't know if y'all can see this here let's do oh my god it looks that? so good there it is um it's pretty much done you just need to like keep it going for a little bit more time but um yeah i just like really encourage people to tap into their 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 senses when they're both writing obviously cooking because like indian cooking is all about aroma and like you know connecting in ways that are deeper than you know connecting to your ingredients and i think like i thought it was an appropriate thing for me to do while we were doing this panel for I'm sure i love that um and then last question um bailey just 
um, had one. So do you have any tips for someone who would want to get into journaling? That's you, Stella. Okay. <laughs> so um, like we mentioned before, um, the free write that we prompted, I think that's like one of the easiest ways, just like sitting down, turning off your phone, like turning off your laptop, or if you work better digitally, like closing all your tabs, except the one you're working on and, and just setting a timer and just like popping off, like going for as long as you can, um, um, like and not stopping, like even if it's the same word for a super long time, eventually you break through and you get to something really concrete and something you like discover about yourself and how you see the world. And I, um, this is not really relevant, but I also really like the Instagram account, we are not really strangers on Instagram because I think they have really good questions if you want some guided journaling. Um, just reflecting on yourself and your relationships and how you just like exist in this world. So that's, that's how I do it. Um, there's also a lot of great resources online. Awesome. Thank you so much, the two of you, for this amazing spiritual enlightenment that we all just experienced. I mean, um, you know, I was doing a little bit of the free write myself, and I think I identify with one of the questioners who asked, you know, how do you prompt that creativity for people that don't feel naturally creative? Um, but what I think you've reminded us is that the personal experiences that we have and how we interact with a world that is, you know, especially for people of color dominated by whiteness and dominated by patriarchy is just that reflection in itself can be so powerful um, and also healing. And so I just, I really appreciate everything that you all just shared. And um, Logan Gita, good luck on your, on your tour. I'm sorry that you uh, kind of have an inopportune time here, but I know everyone watching is going to be following you and will continue to follow along with your work. And so I'm just, I'm thankful for your voice and your light um, and your passion here. And I hope to be able to stay in touch with, with both of you. Thank you so much for joining us today.